this time together here this morning. And God, we again come to you and just ask uh, your blessing upon our time as we study together your word. Father, help us to take hold of those truths that you have for us and help us be changed by them. Help us to trust in the God that you are, the God that can um, support us and provide for us in our times of need. And God, we just ask your blessing upon our time now. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, we are looking at Psalm 13 here this morning. And, and as we prepare to get into Psalm, I, I want to begin this morning by sharing a story of a missionary uh, family. Um, they uh, actually went to Cameroon, and, which is in Central Africa, and they were serving there in Africa. And things changed rather quickly for the worst uh, for this uh, family, for this couple. And the mom writes these words, and I'll just uh, read these to you. She says, one day in March, I received a message that my dad had lung cancer. A godly man, he's always taken such good care of his health. I was stunned. My dad really thought he would be healed. He agreed to everything the doctors suggested, including chemo and radiation. We all prayed with him, but he continued to decline, and with that came extreme suffering, both physically and mentally. We all went back to see him for a month in September, but three weeks after we returned to Cameroon, he died. My family was able to return to the States for a year following his death, spending time with my mom. She was adjusting and attempting to cope with this new reality. When we left her at the end of the year, we felt she was making good strides. So it was nothing short of jarring when three months later, doctors received an inoperable, or discovered an inoperable tumor, tumor on her kidney. They predicted she would survive three more months. I felt devastated, helpless. And then she asked this question, why pray when it hadn't seemed to work with dad? Mom also suffered all the kinds of death cancer wrenches upon the human body. When she died, I felt my trust in God had vanished. I was not sure how I could handle the grief that went along with losing parents. Why would God allow his children to suffer such painful deaths? Didn't he care? Or was he just going to accomplish his purposes no matter how I felt? Not long after my mom's death, we took a vacation to a game park about two days' drive away. It was right before Christmas. Dry season had just begun in West Africa. The total lack of water at the game park meant we bathed in the river, washing the dust from our skin. We had a wonderful time seeing giraffes and many kinds of antelope. Our kids had lots to talk about as we went to bed that night. Just as we were drifting off to sleep, a knock came at our door. We hesitated to open. Who could possibly be visiting us at this time of night and in the bush? On the other side was a fellow missionary we barely knew from a town about three hours away from the game park. He'd traveled to tell us the word he had received through two-way radio. My husband's mother had died suddenly of a stroke. <laughs> she goes on, shock rippled over us in waves. At first, we lo located our Toyota truck and headed home. John radioed on off-grid mission aviation um, organization and flew directly to the city, then grabbed a flight to Nebraska. It was December 15th, almost Christmas. The kids and I managed as best as we could that first week without my husband, but it soon became clear that the river we'd bathed in while at the Waterless Game Park was not without consequences. Lisa, our eight-year-old daughter, developed an eye infection that wouldn't go away. Living so far out in the bush, away from the hospital, had taught me to always carry my medical bag. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but I had a very handy little book where, titled Where There Is No Doctor. The book would describe a set of symptoms than the treatment needed for that particular malady. When Lisa developed a fever, I began to treat malaria. We all had malaria at one time or another, so I knew how to treat that one. But she didn't seem to get better, and then the boys began to also get sick. One by one, our little clinic up the road was run by nationals who didn't have the right medications or any hope of a better treatment. One night, shortly before Christmas, Lisa was lying on the couch by the Christmas tree. Her fever had been particularly high, and she began crying. 
Mommy, mommy, people are coming with knives and taking our Christmas presents. Our oldest son, Jonathan, ran to get a helpful book and began to search until he found a disease that perfectly matched her symptoms. Mom, mom, I found it. But the patient dies within seven days. Can you imagine anything becoming worse for this missionary family? Well, the good news is that the daughter did get better and the boys did get better. But wow, you think of difficult times and we come to this passage in Psalm 13. David authored this passage, King David, the shepherd boy. And the, the title of this message this morning is When God Delays. When God Delays. You know, we can go through some very tough times in life, right? Some very difficult times. Maybe not as difficult as this missionary family, but boy, we can have some very difficult times. Most of us have been there crying out in desperation before to God, wondering, why, God? Why must I wait? Why am I waiting? And won't you, won't you answer my prayers? And, you know, King David's hardships... David's was filled with a difficult life and, and he had his fair share of hardships. David's boyhood had been that of a shepherd boy, many of you know, just one of several sons in a large family and the youngest of sons. But then David, if you don't know this, you'll know now, but David went from a hero to a vil- villain almost overnight. He was once the the, the sung hero of the nation of Israel and, and people were flocking to him and, and just rejoicing in him because he had killed, and you know the story, he killed the big giant Goliath. And many of the, in fact, most of the Israeli army, they weren't about to match up with the giant Goliath and the giant would come day after day and said, who wants to fight me? <laughs> and all the army of Israel ran away. (laughs) And then David, the shepherd boy, shows up and said, I'll fight him. And he fought Goliath and he defeated Goliath and he killed Goliath. And then he was a hero in his home country. But then things changed really, really quick. Saul, King Saul, who was the current king then, became very jealous of David. And you know, many of you know, that then King Saul went and hunted for David, hunted him down and and sought to kill him again and again. And David was on his run throughout his life. And and that giant that he, he killed, I want you to see this, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, was singing and dancing and with joyful songs and timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Now, if you were King Saul and you're honest, you'd be a little bit jealous at that point, wouldn't you? <laughs> and so that's what sent King Saul into this the rage of seeking David's life. And so, so he, David went from hero to villain almost overnight. People turned against him, not only King Saul, but the, the people of the nation of Israel. And then there's two very disheartening stories in Scripture, and I want to bring them up to you to give you a feel for what David was, was going through. The first story happens in the city of Gath. David flees to the city of Gath, and the city of Gath was controlled by the Philistines. And David, trying to get away from King Saul and trying to get away from his wrath, fled to the city. And when he got there, guess what? The locals recognized him. And they said, is it, is it this David? David who killed the Philistines? And then David begins to feign insanity. He He's scratching on the walls and he's drooling on his beard. Look at it. David took these words to heart when he was found out and was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was with, or while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, look at the man. He's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of madman that you have... Bring this fellow here to carry on like this. 
Well, David's plan worked, and they let him go after they found out who he was. And so David continues on fleeing from Saul. Then he comes to another city called Ziklag. David was able to hang out there for several months, and he was in a safe haven, if you will. But then they left on a mission, a military mission. David and his 600 men, they left on a military mission. They went out. They come back to the city, and when they come back to the city, imagine this. From a distance, they saw the city burning. We find out that there was bandits that came in. There was an army that came in and burnt the city to the ground. And this is the sad thing. David and his wife and the wives of all the 600 men and their children were taken and kidnapped from the city. And then we find the story there in the First Samuel in, in t- chapter 30. When David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it and destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Can you imagine that? How does it get any worse for David? Here his loyal men, the 600 men, who were faithful to David all through his journeys, all through his fleeing from King Saul, they then turned on him, and they were ready to stone him. David lost his wives. David lost his children. All the men lost their wives and children. And it's just incredible, uh, uh, incredible amount of events that took place in David's life. But those are just two of them. So here we come to David in this, this psalm. And we need to understand as we get into this psalm that David was actually a fugitive for eight or nine years. Can you believe that? He was on the run for eight or nine years Running away from King Saul, the most powerful man in the nation, David had a lot of hot spots, uh, hideaways, I should say, there in Israel. I was able to visit one <laughs> with my wife, and we had a, a couple others from the church, Dale and Faye Overmeyer, and, and then also Cliff and Nella Mikesell. And this is uh, En Gedi. And you notice, uh, as we made our way down to En Gedi, which is a beautiful, beautiful place, actually a little oasis in the middle of a desert, you'll see that there are these little holes in the side, and those are caves. And some of those caves David actually hid in on his uh, seeking to be ex- ex- escape from King Saul. This is looking out of one of the caves, looking into En Gedi. It's just an incredible place, but I'm telling you, David here, he's living in the caves. He's running away from Saul, uh, seeking to to preserve his life. And King Saul is hot on his trail, continue to be hot on his trail. Well, then we come to Psalm 13. And it's in light of all that we just looked at and considered. And David's crying out to the Lord. And I want you to see it here in Psalm 13. And here is that psalm. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? (laughs) How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Can't you just feel for David, feel the, the, the horrible things that he's going through, the emotional pain that he's going through? David is one who was clearly distraught of all that was going on in his life. And he cries out to the Lord. And by the way, I want you to notice the questions. They all begin with, how long? (laughs) How long, Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How long will my enemy triumph over me? You know, when God delayed, David felt forgotten. And you you begin to go through this psalm and you begin to understand David's turmoil in his own heart and mind. And David, when when God delayed, he, he just felt like God forgot him. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like God forgot you and and has not remembered his love for you? 
And then here's that question again. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Will you forget me forever? Well, David certainly was distraught. And David was thinking that God had forgot him. You know, we get caught up in the waiting game, don't we? And we wait and we wait and we wait and we pray. And God seems to be somewhere else at times. But I want you to know, when those thoughts come of feeling forgotten, let me remind you of something. And here's what you need to be reminded of. When God delays, we must remember he never, ever, ever ceases to care for us. He never does. How do I know that? I want you to see this Isaiah 49. I love this passage. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? This is God speaking to Isaiah, his prophet. Though she may forget, I will not forget you, God says. See, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. If you think for a moment that God has forgotten you, you're wrong. God never forgets us. We're engraved upon the palm of his hand. God is one that always, always remembers us. He never, ever forgets us. You are always on God's mind, and you need to know that. There's something else we need to understand. When God delayed, David felt not only forgotten, but he also felt forsaken. Forsaken is a whole different ballgame, isn't it? Forgotten can be accidental. You can forget an anniversary or a birthday. You can forget special days. You can forget a loved one, perhaps. You know what? This last Thursday, my son Nathan and his wife Amanda had their anniversary. I married him right here in the foyer of Whipperwill Church during COVID. <laughs> it was them. It was Sue and I. It was Bethany, our daughter, and her husband, Tyler. And it was Amanda's parents and her sister, that was it. <laughs> Big wedding. <laughs> they were so thankful to get their marriage license because that was right in the heat of COVID. And it's like, it was crazy. And you would think with an unusual wedding like that, I wouldn't forget the date. But I did. <laughs> I asked my wife just yesterday, when was the Nathan and Amanda's anniversary? I know they're going out on a date here this weekend. When was it? It was Thursday. Oh. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so I wish him a belated happy anniversary. But anyway, you know, forgotten is one thing. Forsaken is a whole different thing. Forsaken is intentional. Uh, for, forsaken is premeditated, if you will. Forsaken is turning your back on someone. David asked the question, how long, not this time, will you forget me? But how long will you hide your face from me? He felt as if God had forsaken him and, and turned away from him. And that is a horrible thing to think of. David's thinking, God must have forsaken and turned away from me. I've been forsaken. That is how you may have yourself felt at times, right? You might remember the time that Jesus spoke those words on the cross. Remember those words? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, God actually did forsake his only son, Jesus Christ, because of the sin that Jesus was taking upon himself. God could not look upon his son. God turned away from his son, Jesus Christ. But you know what? In that one beautiful sacrificial act that took place there, when that happened, it was a promise to us that you and I will never be forsaken by God, ever. God will never forsake us. I love this passage, and I love this truth here. When God delays, we must remember he never ceases to care for us. And I want you to see this. Deuteronomy 31, 6, it's quoted in Hebrews 13, 5. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. And notice, he will never leave you nor forsake you. God will never do it. No matter what you're going through right now in your life, know this, God will never forsake you. He'll never turn his back upon you. When God delayed, David also felt something else. He felt frustration. Look at the passage, the third question, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? And day after day has sorrow in my heart. 
David had this emotional turmoil going on in his heart. David had this, this craziness going on with his emotions. And you know what? The problem began controlling David instead of David controlling the problem. If we are honest, we've all had times when we've said or at least felt like saying, God, I'm really upset about this. I'm really frustrated. I've been praying and praying and praying. And it's as if nothing is ever happening. You know, we can get really frustrated. It happened to David. And it'll happen to us. But remember this. When God delays, we must remember that we can have peace in the midst of the turmoil. You go over to the book of Philippians in chapter 4. The Apostle Paul wrote about this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and then what? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise that we have as believers in Christ. That's the promise that we have from God, that when we are going through a really difficult time, and we're really struggling, and the emotions are boiling up in our hearts and in our minds, we can have peace in the midst of the turmoil. That's good news. Finally, as we look at David's life, we also see that when God delayed, David also felt defeated. He felt defeated. And we see this as, as you continue on in the, the psalm. You look at the very next uh, verse and the very last of the questions. How long will my enemy triumph over me? You know, David felt defeated. Think about this with me. David was one that was anointed king as a shepherd boy. He was just a boy. He was just a lad. Samuel came to him and he, and he anointed David and said, David, you are the next king over Israel. Now imagine that. How long did David have to wait before he actually took the throne? Are you ready for this? 14 years. 14 years he waited. When he was told he was going to be king, he waited 14 years before the fruition of that kingship came. But imagine David's plight. <laughs> imagine this, being told that when you were just an elementary kid, you'd be the next president of the United States. <laughs> imagine that. Or you'd be the next CEO of the giant Amazon. Imagine that. And you were told that as a kid and and that you were actually given that position, sworn in as a president or CEO, you were thinking about that, then every possible thing that could go wrong went wrong. You dreamed of sitting in the Oval Office, or you dreamed sitting in the executive chair in Seattle at Amazon headquarters. And then, instead of that, you're running for your life because you're being hunted down your friends turned against you, and they joined the enemies against you. Imagine that. What that must have been like. That was David's plight. That's what he was going through. For 14 years, he suffered. For 14 years, he didn't know what was going on in his life. David felt very defeated. I doubt that you'll ever face a hostile enemy like David did through King Saul. But we are reminded in the scripture that we do have an enemy. Do you know that? <laughs> but the enemy is Satan himself, and he roars about like a, like a lion, seeking to, what? Devour us. But this is the good news, Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So that's good news, right? Really good news. We're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. So now let's get to the meat. <laughs> what do we do when we're going through a really, really difficult time? What do we do when the rug's pulled out from underneath us? What do we do when, when our dreams are dashed? What do we do when our prayers are unheard? What do we do when God delays? There are two answers there in Psalm 13. 
The first one begins with verse 3. We can pray. Look what David says in verse 3. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. David's praying there. David's praying there in verse 3. And it's a model for us. When we go through difficult times, we need to pray. We need to pray our hearts out to God. And I want you to see this. Let's dig into it a little bit deeper. David prays that God will give light to his eyes. Did you notice? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes. What's David asking there? Here's what he's asking. Are you ready? God, help me to see things from your perspective and not mine. You know, so many times we go through these difficulties and we, we look around us and we see all the bad things and we can't look above them. We can't see, can't see um, through them. We need to understand that when we go through bad times, difficult times, we need to pray that God will rise us above those bad times and look at those times from God's perspective. Look at those times through eternity. And that's so hard to do, isn't it? So hard to do. David says, give light to my eyes. Help me grab a hold of your perspective in this whole situation. Then I want you to see David and who he addresses. Notice, Lord, my God. There are two names there in the Hebrew. Jehovah, that reflects God's promises. And Elohim, which reflects God's power. So David, when he prays, he's praying to the God who is all-powerful and the God who makes promises. Have you reminded yourself of the promises God has made in his word? Have you banked on those promises lately? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We could go through and, and talk about all those promises of God. and We dare not forget those promises. We need those promises when we go through difficult times, don't we? He who began a good work in you will complete it. We could go on and on. Be strong and courageous. <laughs> God tells us he will never leave us. He will strengthen us during difficult times. We need those promises and we need to remind ourselves that God is an all-powerful God. Well, there's something else we can do and as we close out this psalm. Not only can we pray, but we can also sing in those difficult times. Not only can we pray, but we can also sing and we need to be reminded of that. Are you a singer? <laughs> I love to sing, but I'm not sure people love to hear me sing. <laughs> Continue to pray for the worship team up front because I'm right smack front and they can hear every note that comes out of my mouth. And when they do make those weird expressions, it's probably because they're listening to me. <laughs> but I love to sing, but I'm not a singer. But we can sing, and David, David is singing here now as he closes out the song. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. David is actually singing as he's gone through all these difficulties in his life. He prayed, and then he began singing. He began worshiping the Lord. Why did he worship him? Well, because he was, began focusing on his unfailing love. We can ponder God's love, and we must ponder God's love. When we're going through a difficult situation, we need to focus on the fact that God is a loving God. He always loves us. Nothing comes to us except through the loving hands of God first. He never allows anything in our life except it comes through his loving purpose for our lives. God is one who loves us beyond all measure. The Apostle Paul says, hell high and deep and long and wide is the love of Christ for us. I love that passage. We have a God that loves us very deeply. 
David also focuses not only on the love of God, but also focuses on the salvation. We can ponder God's salvation. When we go through a difficult time, we need to think about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. He sent his very own son to die for us. He sent his son to die on the cross for you and I. He gave his very own son to death that we might have life. And not only that, it's not just about that great gift of salvation, but it's also the fact that God rescues us all the time. Rescues us all the time. Some of us have a lot more guardian angels than others. It's like God says, okay, angels, you need to go again. <laughs> You need to help Pastor Brian out of this one. It's a bad one. (laughs) So God takes care of all those little moments in our life as well as the big moments. And we can rejoice in that salvation that we have in Christ. And then finally, then David focuses on, you ready for this? The goodness of God. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Stephen wasn't able to be with us for this uh, final moment. He has a journey to make down south. But, you know, God is good all the time, isn't he? God is a good God. He, he takes the things in our lives and he puts his good purposes in, in, in our lives. And, and when we look at things, knowing that they're all about his goodness, that changes Everything, doesn't it? Are you going through a difficult time now? Is it a really hard time? We need to grab hold of this Psalm 13. We need to know that we can sing in the midst of the difficulty. We can pray in the midst of the brokenness. We can be like David, even though he he suffered terribly. We can be like him and look to God and look to his goodness Look to his salvation, look to his love, sing about it. And then we can also pray to God, knowing that he is an awesome God, a God of promise, and a God of power. I encourage you to do that, would you? If you're going through a difficult time now in your life, go to Psalm 13. It's so helpful. But the musicians are going to come and close us out in a song as we finish out the morning.